Hello and welcome back to the Burr Channel, where we talk about stories in movies, book shows and games, and I stream on twitch.tv slash Jinzy. Stories about the future have always intrigued us as a society. Where will we be in five years? Twenty years? A hundred? Opinions on what that future looks like are divided, of course, as most opinions are, but there's always the theme of individuals working with what they know and finding new ways to upgrade them in several years' time. But as the years go by, our ideas of the future twist and change, become more audacious. And in that same future vision came dystopia. Brilliant minds decided that sometimes thing bad, maybe all thing bad. And what happens if all thing bad? To us, that is. Are these scenarios at all realistic? I mostly wanted an excuse to talk about some dystopian media, I'll be honest. It sounds a little depressing, perhaps, but I'll try to keep it light and fun. I promise. And by the end, perhaps, I can even give you a spark of hope. Gather round the fire, and let me tell you a tale. Well, in the year 2000, um, I think I'll probably be the spaceship to the moon dictating robots to robots. Or else I may be, I don't know, having a, in charge of a robot court, judging some robots. Or I may be at the funeral of a computer. Or if something's gone wrong with their nuclear bombs, I may be sort of coming back from hunting in a cave. Before we talk about our current future, we have to talk about our past future. What did people think things would look like around the year 2000? Because that was always the big year, the new millennium. And predictions had been made as far back as a hundred years before then. In 1900, John Alfred Watkins, an American civil engineer, made quite a few predictions about what the world might look like in the 2000s. Not all of them were accurate, of course. He was very sure that we'd have stopped using the letters C, X and Q by now, for example, and yet here we are still saying things like Xebec and Quab. We're also not all walking 10 miles a day. On the contrary, and mosquitoes, houseflies and roaches are sadly still around. I'm going to call that one wishful thinking on his part, actually. It wasn't complete nonsense, though. In fact, several of his ideas were made a reality sooner rather than later. After consulting some of the greatest minds of his time for their opinion, he accurately predicted something akin to digital photography, mobile phones, modern greenhouses, modern television, tanks and high-speed trains, to name a few. Uh-oh, a modern Frankenstein. Most futuristic designs were based around truly outrageous things, things that unfortunately never came to be, or at least not yet. I still hold out hope personally for a holodeck. Personal flying cars like in the Jetsons, our very own jetpacks, super AI robots, none of that has come to pass. And I say they're outrageous, but of course, anything they could think of would be outrageous to a point. It's difficult as an individual to grasp what might really be possible over the longer stretches of time. Most times, when the future came up in conversation, the visual ideas were always immaculately clean rooms, mostly white and suspiciously devoid of details. Like the whole image was sanitized. I'm not sure if that's because the past was generally dustier, but I'm going to take that assumption and run with it. Everything was done by a robot, of course, and for some reason the subject of underwater whale buses came up weirdly often, as well as boat shoes. You seem to find this all very amusing. I might. If we weren't on our way to help some suffering and dying humans who- Your species is always suffering and dying. A society thriving on clean energy, water sprouting in the desert, hoverboards. People were very focused on all the positives, the conveniences, and everything being electric because electricity was quite new, so naturally in the future there would just be electricity everywhere. We'd barely use our hands. Spoon? Electric. Broomstick? Electric. My hair? Electric. If something wasn't automated, did it really have a place in our future? I think not. Because of this, people like John Maynard Keynes strongly believed that as productivity improved through all this automated labor, people would work less and play more. Or rather, pursue leisure activities. He supposed that happiness was more related to pursuing non-material ends than buying a lot of stuff. But that didn't quite happen, did it? In Star Trek, a science fiction show about space exploration for those unfamiliar, all of our wildest dreams had come true. There was no war on Earth. 
Sure, aliens still waged war, but not us. We were beyond that. We didn't work for money. We had all of our basic needs met. Replicators simply created everything we wanted. Or, as Captain Picard might say... Tia Greyhot. That beverage has not been programmed into the replication system. <laughs> People work to earn the admiration of their peers and to do what's right. A utopia, if you will. There aren't many shows that explore that concept, for good reason, too. Let's look into that a little further. Hey, John, we got a new project? Oh, war? Not particularly. Uh... E explosions, at least, though? Yes and no. Swords? Some, but not really either. W what's the point without swords? Well, it's about a society where we don't really do the fighting bit anymore? At all? Well, unless we meet other civilization who still do the fighting bit. So what you're saying is we just found a new target. Yes, but everyone's very nice about it and we do try to talk it out. But if that doesn't work... Lasers and explosions. Yes! A utopia is an idealized world. Or rather, an idealized world according to the writer. Whatever the narrative, it aligns perfectly with what the author decides is perfection, to a point. It doesn't mean a utopian society doesn't have problems or conflicts, but that the world at large operates in perfect harmony. The term itself was coined by Sir Thomas More, an English philosopher. Apparently, it was a bit of satire on his part. Utopia is derived from the Greek prefix ou, meaning not, and topos, meaning place. So, a non-existent place. Complete fiction. Utopia, in Greek, however, means good place. And it's pronounced exactly the same way when you say it in English. Sir Moore really didn't mean for his work to be taken this literally, but the term certainly stuck. Moore wasn't the first person to think of utopian societies, though, obviously. In about 370 BC, Plato published a work by the name Republic, describing, in essence, a utopian state. And that inspired others to think of similar scenarios. But these utopian ideas were never realized. No world is perfect, after all. In The Matrix, Agent Smith notes that, at one point, the machines created an absolute paradise for humanity to exist and thrive in. But humanity couldn't accept that any of that was real. It was literally too good to be true. So they started rejecting The Matrix, and adjustments had to be made. Without suffering, we would always know something was off. But does it really matter if something's real or not, as long as we perceive it as real? If the Matrix offered you a perfect world, a perfect reality, would you take it? The Giver, a 1993 novel by Lois Lowry, explores something quite similar to a utopia in a way. In this story's world, strong emotions have basically been outlawed. Nothing that can even elicit strong emotions is allowed. No colors, no love. You must apologize immediately when you offend someone. When too many children are born, some are simply killed, and when you get old, again, you just get killed. Everyone is very much okay with that. Oh, and most importantly, no memories. No one has any memories of the past. None of the happy ones and none of the bad ones, of sunny skies or of war. The idea behind this world is that if everything is regulated, then nothing out of the ordinary will happen and no crime will exist. Outside of the sanctioned murders, of course. In the book, a young child is chosen to become the receiver. You probably already guessed that the receiver is to receive every single memory in existence from the previous receiver now called the Giver. Eventually, the two of them decide that memories are a necessary evil and work to release them back into the wild, because the good memories outweigh the hurt of the bad. But in the eyes of everyone living in this particular society, the way things were previously was a utopia. Jonas, the protagonist and the Giver, only becomes upset with the way of things the moment he was given memories for the first time. This isn't a dystopian society in the same way that many others are. Technically, no one is suffering directly through lack of knowledge, except for the receiver. Oh my god! They're getting murdered! Oh no, they're not being murdered, they're being released. Murder! It's called murder! That's barbaric. We don't do that here. Look, they're cutting that man into pieces! Separated. They're being separated. It's perfectly normal. They are screaming. 
in agony. Harmonizing. See, the two wielders are harmonizing along. The two wielders wield a giant axe. Tool. A tool used for activities. I'm going to invent the atomic bomb again. The giver's vision of a utopia is a very strict one. It only works for as long as no one asks questions and no one learns more. The very definition of ignorance is bliss. But once the veil is lifted, there's no going back. At that point, it becomes a dystopia. And there are various versions of dystopian societies to be found in media. A lot of them seem to take place in a post-apocalyptic world, but those are generally the most boring ones. And in movies, it includes a lot of different shades of brown, but not much else. The dystopian societies that interest me the most are those that seem to function just fine. Unless... I think it'll be a... Uh... Um, people will be regarded more as statistics and as actual people. And that sort of fiction was everywhere at one point. A lot of people pointed George Orwell's 1984 as the first ever dystopian novel, but of course it wasn't. As far as I could find, it was actually a novel written by a Russian author, Yevgeny Zamyatin, called We. In 1921, Yevgeny Zamyatin wrote the dystopian novel We. And this book was largely considered to be the birth of modern dystopian fiction, as it focused heavily on political commentary, specifically towards the Soviet Union in this case, by making the dystopian society an almost direct analogy for whatever political framework one wanted to criticize. Unsurprisingly, We was the first work to ever be banned by the Soviet censorship board, only for Zamyatin to then smuggle the book to the West for publication anyway. So let me walk you through the story of We quickly. Or as quickly as possible, anyway. Our protagonist, D503, because we no longer have names, just numbers, lives in a place called One State. This city or country, it isn't specified really, is a big, sprawling and completely sanitized place, with gigantic walls so high that birds can barely fly over them. The buildings are all made of glass, so everyone can see straight into your life whenever and wherever. Couldn't have you do something suspicious, after all. The only times one can have some privacy is during your scheduled sex hours. The sexual partners can be requested, of course. Anyone, anytime. Because love doesn't really play a role, and the state believes we should all have access to everyone. But no getting pregnant without the okay from one state. There are no clouds, the sky is perfectly clear, perfectly empty, and everyone works on a schedule called the table. There is only one hour each day that one might use for personal business, and uh, generally speaking, that personal business is the same every day for everyone, all of the time. Other than this personal hour, there is no personal anything. There is only one state. As they say in the novel, we comes from God. I from the devil. One day, however, D503 begins to have concerning feelings about a woman called I-330, someone he is not assigned to. This I-330 turns out to be a rebel who disagrees entirely with the way one state is ran. She frequently stays in an old apartment building from the before times called the Ancient House. She even disregards the table at times. Not only that, but she and her compatriots plan to hijack the Integral. This being a spaceship D-503 is working on, that one state intends to launch into space to find other life forms they can spread one state to. There are still people living outside of the walls of one state, I-330 tells us. Very hairy, but seemingly happier people. D-503, eventually convinced that I-330's cause is a righteous one, and also he's hopelessly in love with her, decides to help her. And that doesn't go well, unsurprisingly, and the book culminates with D-503 and practically everyone else undergoing the operation. A surgical operation akin to a lobotomy that removes all imagination because one state didn't like it when everybody didn't vote for the benefactor for the 48th time in a row. How is he supposed to stay a dictator like that? This causes D-503 to immediately report I-330 and the rebels, leading to their execution. Although they did manage to break the wall during their rebellious acts, but after living in confusion throughout the entire book, D-503 finally feels happy again, now that he's back to his ignorant self. Or at least what he believes to be happiness, of course. 
Isn't it nice to not make decisions? I love having no input in my daily life. Timetables are great. I only wish the party would watch while we have sex, too. What? I... For safety reasons. Safety reasons? I'm really into safety. So am I. This isn't a happy ending, not in the least. I guess that much is obvious. One state controls everything anyone does. There is no freedom of choice or freedom of anything. But there is no crime, it seems. So what's the problem? If everyone perceives their situation as true happiness, D-503 seems quite content until I-330 sows the seeds of confusion in his mind. Well, that's not really the case. During several points in the book, we see people punished for stepping out of line. D-503 himself falls in love with I-330, although he isn't aware of what that emotion is yet. The feeling is still there, only removed when his imagination is terminated. Emotions are real, they're just suppressed. Throughout this story, there's often talk of a rebellion to end all rebellions, that these sorts of things no longer happen. But then it does. There's no such thing as the last rebellion, and the wall remains broken in the end. The ending is not happy, but it does leave room for hope. That's something a lot of dystopian tales do. Yes, everything is awful, but it could be better. We have the power to make it better. The state may try their best to suppress our true selves, but there will always be another rebellion. We spawned a whole host of stories that are eerily similar in many ways. The most well-known one is still 1984 by George Orwell. The book everyone says they read but probably didn't, but they'd still like to say things are getting very Orwellian up in here, so let's just say we did. This is where Big Brother is watching you and the Thought Police comes from. It's not that different from we, except there is absolutely a divide between the haves and the have-nots. An inner circle with vastly different privileges than the outer circle. The party controls everything, watches your every move, through televisions you can never turn off. The mildest of things can get a person caught, and when you are caught, which does happen to our poor protagonist, you don't get executed, but you get re-educated. Or rather, tortured until you too agree that yes, 2 plus 2 does equal 5. If that's what the state says, then it must be true. In 1984, dissenters aren't removed entirely, just reprogrammed to nod their heads whenever they're told what's what. And they're perfectly happy with that by the end, so it seems. So that's two important dystopian novels down, but 1984 was not the only grim story from Orwell's mind. One of his other well-known stories is Animal Farm, and we do have to bring that one up too. The story about a farm where the lower class overthrows the upper class in order to create a different, better future. Now everything would be more equal. Except all of this was shown in the shape of animals overthrowing humans, of course. At first that worked very well until some of the lower class animals, the pigs, simply became the upper class once more, and they ousted Snowball, the only socialist, changing nothing at all save the faces of their masters. Although ironically, in the final lines of the book, the lower class animals note that they can no longer see the difference between the faces of the pigs and that of the humans. Animal Farm in particular is interesting because it highlights the idea of threatening the what-if through a character named Squealer. As the situation on the farm deteriorates, Squealer, the pig's propaganda machine, keeps mentioning that it might be bad, but if they didn't do this, the humans would return. We wouldn't want the humans to return, would we? And no, indeed we wouldn't. Except by this point, the pigs were doing the same, if not worse, as the humans were. That's even mentioned by the humans visiting the farm eventually. Shouldn't we worry about that too? We are allowed to worry about more than one single thing, surely. But is there even anything we can do about the situation if we do worry? If we ignore what Big Brother tells us and decide we want to change something, well, that's the point of dystopian stories that became popular in our more recent young adult stories especially. The creation of the dystopian narrative began in the early 20th century, when attitudes towards human nature and society started to change across the globe. 
people living in the 16th and 17th centuries were generally agreed to think of the future as bright. They had faith in human progress and man's capacity to create a world of justice and peace. That didn't work out. Dystopian novels were written and they were not a happy place to be in. And they wouldn't be for quite a long time. They didn't generally have happy endings, and if they did, it would only show the possibility of a happy ending somewhere else down the line. Until at some point, writers decided that they wanted to write about dystopian worlds that did have a happy ending. Or at least a truly, obviously hopeful ending. The newer dystopian novels, and movies too, really, include less cool future tech and a lot more of the look, hunger was solved because we eat pills now, or no, it's okay, we all wear the same suits, so we've solved fashion, I think. Nothing has ever really improved in any way whatsoever. We still don't have flying cars, and especially in young adult novels, there's this theme of us versus them. But both sides have a chance at winning. The Hunger Games, Divergent, Maze Runner. Their societies are all ran by a corporation or an elite upper crust. But the protagonist is only ever powerless at the very start. And they are never so debilitatingly powerless that they don't really stand a chance. Oh my god, look at that collective of strangely hot teens. They're making a mess of things. <laughs> uh-oh. What do you mean, uh-oh? A collective of hot teens just after we've reformed into a collective of easy-to-understand groups? Oh no. With one overarching ruling party, which in turn is ruled by a single easy-to-hate individual. We're in a young adult dystopian movie. Whoever's the hottest teen, stay away from them. They're a danger magnet. Young adult novels of this type really took off with The Hunger Games around 2008. And in the real world, an economic crisis started around 2007, 2008. Are we seeing a pattern here? No, maybe? I'm not actually making any statements here. I just thought that was interesting. Uh, I'm an entertainer, not an economist. However, isn't it interesting that economic staying power plummeted and a book about the proletariat fighting back against the rich tyrants who don't seem to have really done anything to improve society much because they were too busy hoarding money suddenly became extremely popular? No? Anyone? In these novels, there's always a chosen one. The chosen one who can fix everything, change the world, change the future, fight the power, the one who opens their eyes suddenly to the injustice and decides to take a stand. Something... Something we can't really do ourselves. We don't have a chosen one. Nobody has superpowers unless we suddenly start developing quirks a la My Hero Academia. Please, that would be so cool. And the world still kind of sucks sometimes. The age of information has broadened our horizons in a lot of ways. It allowed me to learn things and make this video, as well as many other videos. And also, it has allowed me to doom scroll on Twitter while I sink ever deeper in the YouTube algorithm that tells me about all the terrible things the future will bring us. The world has opened up for all of us, and industries everywhere are trying their hardest to grab our attention. And what grabs our attention better than abject terror? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Why are we like this? Rhetorical question. I know why we all need therapy. And because we've all set up our pop-up shop in the endless void, it's a lot harder to think up a fictional scenario to rival our own reality. Our reality seems really bleak already. The Soil and Green, the movie, takes place in 2022. That's just around the corner. And you know what? I believe it. That movie, based on the book Make room, make room, that did not in fact include the idea that uh, Soylent Green is people, worked with the idea of overpopulation. The world is getting very full. You're right, we should probably come up with new innovative ways to create living spaces. There is not enough food. Uh, let's work on that uh, supply chain issue people keep bringing up. What's that about anyway? We should eat other people. What? If we eat other people, we solve two problems at the same time. I kind of feel like you're creating a third though. Let's make a big factory to process dead people. Maybe a fourth problem too. Murder solves everything. Well, I can't argue with that one. A lot of people tout the the world is getting too full idea constantly, and we seem to believe it's a new trend, but it's not really. 
Make Room, Make Room actually set its timeline during 1999 and noted that the US was highly overpopulated at 344 million. It was 329.5 million during 2020, by the way. Dystopian fiction does that often. Take a presumed fear and make it real. What if the robots take over? What if overpopulation? What if a terrible disease runs rampant? None of them ever come true, of course. Well, mostly. And we have our own fears these days, which I won't be discussing because YouTube will fire its laser at this video at an absolutely inconceivable speed. But think about this quickly. For yourself, what are some of the things you look forward to in the future? When you think about our world years from now, what does it look like? According to most of the internet, it looks like a hellscape. And our media reflects that too, of course. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's been watching Squid Game, but that particular concept has been done before, and I'm sure the creators of Squid Game have at the very least heard of this book. In The Running Man. Don't walk away yet, I don't mean the movie. The movie is fun, of course, but compared to the book it doesn't translate very well. In the movie, Arnold Schwarzenegger is blackmailed into participating in The Running Man where the prize is that he lives, which he does. He's Arnold, he blows up everything and everyone and walks away with the girl. That sounds like your average action flick, doesn't it? That's because it is. The book, however, hits a little too close to home. And after I tell you how it plays out, you're going to think, well, doesn't that sound familiar? It's the year 2025. Ben, the protagonist, has money problems up the wazoo the cost of living has risen exponentially while pay has stayed basically the same, which means the gap between the haves and the have-nots has widened significantly. There are a few jobs, and the ones that are there do not pay well. Not to mention most of them pay with… old money. <laughs> that almost sounds like a good thing, but it isn't. Old money is worth less than new money, and spending old money also identifies the spender as a poor person. Ew. Gross. Poor people. Apparently. Ben also has a deathly ill daughter, and so to make ends meet and pay the outrageous medical bill, Ben decides to join the game show The Running Man. He has to be chosen to be allowed to join, so he's very lucky, clearly. The show throws a person into the open, and every hour they can stay alive, they earn a hundred dollars. The catch is that special hunters attempt to track and kill you the moment the game starts. Officers of the law also aid in that hunt, and if regular citizens can point out where you are, they get paid a bounty. But if the runner, the person competing in the show, manages to kill a hunter or officer, they get an extra hundred for each head. If you can make it the full 30 days, you win a billion dollars. New dollars too, so extra special. Of course, with the entire world hunting you, no one's ever made it that far. The record before Ben joins is eight days and five hours, so not even close. And if you're thinking of just staying in one place in the middle of nowhere for the full 30 days, think again. They've thought of that too. The participant has to send in two tapes recorded that day, every single day. Ben's trip through this hell is interesting to say the least. The people love to watch. The game shows, because there are multiple, are meant to distract the rest of the population from the totalitarian state of the world. Bread and games. No one's actually supposed to win the billion dollars. Ben knows that too. This isn't Ben risking his life so his family can pay their medical bills. This is Ben sacrificing his life for a chance to make enough money to hopefully pay his family's medical bills after he's dead. For a while. He does beat the record days alive and eventually dies by crashing a plane into the Games Network headquarters, so he's got that going for him. Yes, that kills him if there was any confusion. Anyway. Doesn't that sound familiar? In the movie, Ben gets blackmailed and forced into the game. The book is that much more powerful because Ben willingly chooses to throw himself into the game. But even then, it's only an illusion of choice. Ben doesn't really have anywhere else to go. No other way to pay his bills. America! I'm talking about America right now! Oh my god! Oh, I think, um, what? all these atomic bombs will be dropping around the place. And it was 
One will get near the centre because it will sort of make a huge, great big crater, and then the whole world will just melt, and the world will become one vast atomic explosion, and it will become like a supernova, stars. It's not just America, of course, but it's a pretty good example. This particular type of dystopia is a lot of people's reality, and there are also other places that are bad. I still can't name any names because of the whole laser thing, but let me give you a quick list on most applicable traits for a dystopian society. 1. Propaganda is used to control the citizens of any given society. 2. Information, independent thought and freedom are restricted. 3. A figurehead or concept is worshipped by the citizens of the society. 4. Citizens are perceived to be under constant surveillance. 5. Citizens live in a dehumanized state. 6. Citizens conform to uniform expectations. 7. The society is an illusion of a perfect utopian world. John, hmm? what are you playing with over there? We have work to do. Oh, I bought a one-on-one -on -one replica of a certain emperor. Uh, Certain emperor? Yeah, and Daivan is a country. John, you're going to get us lasered. I have to stand up for what's right. And also, this plushie was very cute. It is very cute. Right? And the similarity is uncanny. O outside of the cuteness. No, outside of the cuteness. Are we going to get disappeared for this? Most definitely. I am going to get so much shit from the bots for these jokes, I swear. Also, there's a country that's very northern and has a lack of K-pop that falls into every single category twice. These are not great examples of a future we'd like to see. At least, most of us. But looking at the list I just gave you, do you recognize any of those points in your own space? Because I do. And some of them have been accepted as normal by now. We don't talk about that because there is no war in Ba Sing Se. But I'll stop depressing you now for a hot minute. In the past, we were always hopeful of the future. We looked forward to great scientific advances, Things getting better. Of course, things would get better. Hadn't they always? Except then it didn't. Because economic downfalls came about. Bursting housing bubbles. And why are there so many billionaires now? And why aren't they paying taxes? And could they start? If you're wondering why progress stagnates, it's that money. People who found a way to make money and don't want anyone to rock that boat unless they can make more money off of it somehow. It's why the oil industry still exists. So, yes, our progress slowed down substantially, and that can be disheartening. However, that doesn't mean there is no progress at all. You can slow the march of science, but you can't ever fully stop it. At the moment, some hopefuls believe that by the year 2030, we'll be using mostly solar-powered homes, smart lights to wake us up, smart toilets to tell us exactly what we should be eating, the technology tipping point, they say, should be 2025. That's almost around the corner, really. They expect 3D printed cars and even 3D printed organs, robotic pharmacists and small cities without traffic lights, will work from home and attend meetings as a hologram, and even 4D imaging is on the horizon, and it won't be bulky like today's virtual reality, but as convenient as a pair of sunglasses. We finally have virtual reality! That's very cool. I could pretend to be on a tropical island for like a week. I can finally simp for my anime and video game crushes in real time! What a real touchable Shota Aizawa. It's like saying Nijima is really here. Ma'am, I, I don't think I am never leaving virtual reality. Please don't turn this into a clinic of horror story. Goodbye forever real world! And of course, there will be inventions or discoveries that could be problematic in some way, like CRISPR, short for Continuous Regularly Interspersed Short Palindromic Repeats. Gene editing. Gene editing could be abused wildly, but it could also solve a million different medical problems. We've definitely fallen into the trap of only seeing the bad sides of new technology in a lot of ways. If you really try, anything can be used for evil, but if that doesn't breed stagnation, I don't know what does. Technology also isn't the only thing that requires progress, though societal systems do too. I'm fully aware that the majority of dystopian problems are not brought on by the lack of technological advancements. It's people, and the systems they abuse. Specifically very rich people. Billionaire boot connoisseurs might tell you that the systems in place right now 
work fine. And you just have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And if you're so smart, why don't you make a better system? But that's not how things work, of course. The truth is, most systems we use today were not really thought out all that well to begin with. In fact, largely, the main goal of said systems was to make life easier for a very select few people. Like the people creating the system. The people who have a lot of money. Time is a luxury not afforded to all through the power of capitalism. Dystopian fiction would often look at the times of the past as good, happy, or free. But that's already no longer the case for us, so how can our dystopian future fiction look back on our current day and age and think, yes, that was the kind of living we should aspire to return to? Bread and games have made its glorious return, or perhaps it never left. Reality TV, watching others break down so we can think to ourselves, well, my life is a bit shit, but at least it's not that shit. Those in power know that only as a group do we truly affect change. So as long as they can keep some of us preoccupied, others fighting amongst each other, others yet simply too busy trying to stay alive, they'll be fine. We can't fight back. Divided we fall. As we speak, we are doing things that our past selves would have found dystopian in and of themselves. Ludicrous. No one would ever do this. No sane mind would agree. The movie How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb is an accurate representation of the world's political climate at this point. And we're busier arguing on social media than we are actually doing anything substantial. NFTs exist. Americans still worship work at every hour because self-flagellation is the national kink, I guess. But it's so easy to get stuck in all the things we're doing wrong. All the things that are going wrong. We are teetering on a dystopian reality for some we're already there, but that doesn't mean the future is purely darkness. We are at a turning point. Again, humanity has had lots of those. John Maynard Keynes supposed by now that we'd work less, have more spare time, and that was the natural progression after all. But to stop that from ever happening, our money-having overlords have convinced us that no, we never have enough. We must keep consuming. If we don't consume, the economy will grind to a halt, and the world will literally end. We must consume, so we must work. Let me tell you all the things that are wrong with you so you want to consume more. The promised land will never be reached. We will never work less as long as we keep the systems we have. Only more. Practically everyone supports proper medical coverage. They're no trying to sell Mario as an NFT, so no one else can play Mario politics. in the Mario Elon game. Elon Musk tells Imagine us if someone else Mario will tell him and then never being allowed to play Mario, Mario because you haven't bought the NFT dollars. of Mario. Knowing full well that this isn't how it works and this absolute waste of breath just wants to pretend like he's been hungry like he did with the kid in the cave that he did not rescue or the ventilators that he and she still left The World Wide Fund for Nature now sells NFTs even though they are extremely harmful to the environment they purport to protect. Isn't that just a little too ironic? Oh my god, there's meteors raining down on Earth! Oh god, is the economy okay? What the hell do you mean? There are demons crawling from the ground! My oligarchy is crumbling! Please somebody update me on the stock market! Megalodon have respawned all across the Earth, and it looks like, uh, Godzilla and King Ghidorah are real, and they're currently sparring in the center of the Earth. I need to liquidate my assets! Everyone is dying! Oh good, my medical branches are booming, thank god. I am going to commit a murder. I don't think there is going to be atomic warfare, but I think that there is going to be all this automation. People are going to be out of work and a great population. I think something has to be done about it. Dystopian fiction, in a lot of cases, revolves around a subsect of people attempting to create a utopia while in the process creating a dystopia instead. Our future can still go either way. We're not lost, just wandering. We could continue down a path where public perception manipulation changes our views to such a point that, like in 1984, we eventually agree that, yes, 2 plus 2 does equal 5. Whatever you say is the truth, of course, big brother. Or we do our best to choose another path. One where technological advancement benefits everyone, not just the rich few. A path where we aim to fix economic inequality to a point where there is no homelessness, no hunger, where we see each other as equals. We have that power already. We need only use it. 
Yes, we do have robot dogs with guns, but to end this video, I'd like to focus on some inventions that are good, great even, things that are going to make our life better in the future, like this robotic arm with full range motion and incredible strength made by Automaton Robotics, a YouTube channel that you should definitely keep an eye on. Imagine what this could do for future prosthetics or even proper AI builds. If you were to put skin around this, you couldn't even tell it's not a hand of flesh and blood. The gene editing I was talking about earlier is well on its way to cure inherited diseases. In 2014, Hendo also did create hoverboards. Yes, finally. They're not perfect yet and they're definitely very expensive and nothing close to Back to the Future's hoverboards, but the entire deal with most technology is that we figure out how something works first and then we streamline it afterwards. You can buy actual exoskeletons these days. Yes, very expensive, I know. So you can walk with a spinal injury. There's also levitating light bulbs. Also expensive and not very high power, but I dream of a day where my room can have nothing but floaty balls of light to illuminate it. Solar roadways that heat up to melt snow and can even be programmed to show markers. We're working on safer nuclear power and it's extremely heartening to see that the attempts of bosses to get people back into the office for arbitrary reasons like my whip doesn't reach all the way to your house don't seem to be taking root very well. We might even have a time limit. It's been speculated by many that either in 2045 or 2050, something called the singularity could take place. A hypothetical point in time at which technological growth becomes uncontrollable and irreversible, resulting in unforeseeable changes to human civilization. Generally, it takes the shape of an AI running away with itself. So either way, if we do mess things up and 2050 hits, the AI would inevitably become Agent Smith and find us the planet's greatest disease. So things will take care of themselves. What we do in the coming years will determine whether we move close to a dystopia or we might give ourselves a chance at a utopia. And remember that in 1889, a man named Charles H. Duell was quoted to have said, everything that can be invented has been invented. 1889. He was only a little bit wrong. Humanity is a lot more inventive than we give ourselves credit for, and while that currently takes the form of amassing wealth, when the going gets tough, I feel confident that we'll figure something out. I'm well aware of how naive a lot of this might sound to you, but I do believe that the moment we decide to give up entirely, to just accept that dystopia is here, and there are no fixes, and nothing will ever get better, that's when we have, in fact, truly reached dystopia. There is no rebellion to end all rebellions. I didn't want to make yet another video listing all the reasons we're screwed as a race. There are plenty of those already. So if you do know of any cool inventions that are only now taking any hold, do let me know in the comments. Let's try to envision a future we can look forward to, even when it's hard, until another tale finds us. Long ago, in the beautiful, gorgeous, very amazing past lived the glorious, very amazing Wolgai the Illustrious. Everything was great and amazing until the machines attacked. Septic the Murderous and Kulsta the Bloody programmed all the machines in the world to kill everyone. It was bloody and not at all glorious. Wolgai the Illustrious was slain by the evildoers, the valiant resistance, led by Robertson, the most warsome, fought back against the evil machines. Unfortunately, everyone who survived had now been brainwashed into thinking everything was still beautiful, gorgeous, and very amazing. Mike, Spheres, and Ray Ray infiltrated the machine's base to destroy their awful mind-warping devices, but were foiled by Adrian Packle and his super-destructive war machine of doom. It was all a ruse, however. Meanwhile, Codename Black had infiltrated the machine base and installed a Windows update, crashing their network forever. The end. That story sucked. You suck!